Hi Converse family, I'm Kyla and this is Abby. We are the co-founders of Pure Nowhere, which is an international music and culture magazine based in Melbourne, Australia and Los Angeles, California. We've been running Pure Nowhere for over four years now and thanks to our friends at Converse, today we'll be leading a very exciting interview um, with a very special guest who's a huge inspiration to both Abby and I. Jefferson Hack is a curator, editor, and creative director, best known as the co-founder of Days Magazine. Curated in 1991 when he was just 19 years old, Days was originally published as a black and white fanzine, created to celebrate a growing community rooted in counterculture and youth perspective. Since then, Jefferson has grown Days into a flourishing independent media empire, founding several new creative companies under the Days name, including Another Magazine, Another Man, and Nowness and featuring cover stars such as Harry Styles, Billie Eilish, FK Twigs, David Bowie, and Bjork, just to name a few of my favorites. Additionally, he's created the creative agency Day Studio, where he's worked with brands such as Burberry, Calvin Klein, Gucci, Versace, and dozens more. Today, the Day's media company continues to produce stories across its various print, digital, and video brands, all overseen by Jefferson in the role of creative and editorial director. So, without further ado, please join us in welcoming Jefferson Hack. I'm already here. <laughs> Thanks so much for the wonderful introduction, both of you. I feel really honored that you have chosen me to um, be part of this program. And I wanna say thanks to Converse for hosting us all. And um, what time is it where, where you are? So one of you's in Melbourne and one of you's in LA, right? Yeah, so right now it is 3.40 a.m. for me. So it's a little, bit, a little bit early or late, depending how you run your days. Yeah, Kyla definitely drew the short straw there. So I'm in Melbourne and it's just before 9 p.m. here for me. Great. So you're you're both kind of early risers or late starters, but for me that used to be club closing time, depending on what kind of <laughs> club I was going to. Oh my god! Stepping out of Bergheim at nine a.m. in the morning, or coming out of like the West End at four a.m. <laughs> I love that so much. What time is it for you right now? I think it's like midday in London. So yeah, around eleven thirty. Beautiful. So it's prime time. Um, beautiful. So would you mind if we jumped right into the interview with the first question? Let's do it. Cool. So um, why did you see an opportunity? By the way, I have a question for you. I love your name. Pure Nowhere is just such an amazing name. How did you come up with it? Thank you so much. Um, Pure Nowhere was actually so... Um, Abby and I were running two separate publications at the time before we before we merged together into the current Pure Nowhere. So it was my previous name um, and it was sort of the feeling that you get in the back of your mind, you know, how a specific song can envelop a moment and it'll take the feeling and the emotion and the smell and the touch. And every time you listen to it, you get like these little hints of like, like nostalgia, but it's a very captured feeling. And so I wanted to create it's a term that sort of encapsulates. A blissful that. quality to it, hasn't it? Was it the same mm -hmm. for you, Abby? Was it the same? Yeah. It was really interesting because it was Kyla's original name of her publication, but when we met and kind of figured out what we wanted to do, the name, it really meant as much to me as it had to her originally. It just really feels like you get a feel for how, you know, because we are so, we are half digital and we're completely international based and mostly online operated. So for me, it just really represents how we don't really exist anywhere and it kind of, we want to be a home for anyone and everything essentially. Fantastic. Yeah, it's like being everywhere and nowhere at the same time or that kind yeah. of blissful state of being when you're entering into unknown territory a little bit like exactly. unknown pleasures you know exactly oh my gosh I love that album so much Joy Me Division is one of my favorites I feel like we're kindred spirits already we haven't even got started I love that oh yes the moment you mentioned the moment you mentioned that I was like yes this will be a beautiful conversation <laughs> Um, okay, lovely. So why did you see an opportunity to create days? And how do you feel that that goal um, of the platform has continued to evolve over its history? And adding on to that, why do you feel it's so important to create a space for creatives, especially those often dubbed as outsiders, which is something that we read in one of your previous interviews that kind of stood out to us? Wow, now you're really taking me down memory lane. Wow. <laughs> Um, we're talking about the early 90s, so 1990, circa 1991, I think the second summer of love. So it's the height of acid house culture, it's the Stone Roses and Spike Island, it's um, you know, ecstasy culture, it's the poll tax riots, it's, um, it's this feeling of uh, free parties, raves, um, sound systems, 
um, DIY, sort of do it yourself. And I was studying journalism, Rankin was studying photography. We were both in art college at the London College of Printing and we were doing the magazine for all of the combined art colleges. So that's Martin, Campbell, Chelsea. And we were, I don't know, we just um, had the bug, you know, we made the student magazine and, we, and I got the bug. And, um, and then um, pretty much after that, made the first issue of Days, as like you said, as a black and white fanzine. And, um, you know, it was a way of kind of connecting to all of what was going on in culture for us at that time. And also being part of that spirit of just um, publish and be damned, you know, and, and self-publishing and DIY culture. And, and um, very much like you're doing, we linked it to events and we always had parties when we launched the magazine. And, you know, the first issue I think was um, William Burroughs on the cover. Um, there was um, digital art when it was still at the beginning of kind of what is digital art. There was um, issue two was like all, all uh, portraits that Rankin took in, in clubs and parties of of, of kids that were just self-expressing. Um, there was um, interviews on um, poly, kind of on, 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 on queer, radical queer um, theory there were, and politics. There was uh, Gilbert and George. So it was this real mix of like art, fashion, club culture, psychedelics, Terence McKenna, William Burroughs. So it was, it was, it was just connecting the dots, you know? And then I think the game changer for me was when we met Malcolm McLaren, um, who, as you, some of you might know, was the um, former manager of the Sex Pistols. And he really just, um, you know what he said to me? He said, it's better to be a benign failure than it is to be a, I know it's better to be a flamboyant failure than a benign success. And what he was, I love that. What he was doing was teaching me that it's okay to fail like stay independent, stay independent, stick to what you're about and don't give a fuck because it's better to be a flamboyant failure than a benign success. And so he really taught me the importance of, of, of making your own mistakes, learning shit the hard way. And then he said, yeah, the record companies have got all the money. They're the banks for culture, go and rob them. And then we kind of did. But that's <laughs> I love that so much though. I feel like that's very true to like original punk culture as well, which I know is like super ingrained into the ethos of Dazed. So that story is really interesting to hear because it kind of like connects some of those dots back to the beginning. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I could keep going, but I think you, you, I need you to steer the conversation. <laughs> oh, I could have this conversation forever, honestly. Um, so our next question is sort of traditional publishing. It's changed a lot over the course of career. Um, days, you know, it came along right at the start and then the digital age just kind of took off um, and you've had a really he huge hand in shaping this landscape and how it is today. I'm sort of wondering, like, what does the future of digital and print look like to you? And what do you think have been some key points in this evolution? Well, um yeah, I mean, it was 10 years before really kind of digital mm. thinking hit days because we started in the early 90s. So it was around the 2000s when it really kicked in. And the first sort of um, impact on it was really on digital photography um, before the Internet. Um, and that was a lot about kind of experimentation with um, image manipulation and surrealism and fantasy and you know we really see it in kind of the experiments that Nick Knight and Alexander McQueen were doing in the magazine and various other photographers so it was this ama amazing moment for me to witness that but I think um, you know bringing it right up to, to today without going into like a long history of, of, of kind of digital and print and, and the internet and, and launching web magazines and social media I think the the interesting thing right now is the return to print. The, right now, the return to print is really fascinating, you know, and I noticed that you guys just published your first print publication, right? And, um, and I saw all the comments on, on, um, on Instagram and on your stories and stuff, you know, that the kind of fetishization of the object was just so real, you know? And I think that it almost feels like a kind of return, you know, like this return to vinyl that is so real it's the same with print publications, right? It's the, 
it's the tactility it's wanting to be able to collect and preserve the culture and really have it to hand not something that's just um, as disposable as digital culture is and as ephemeral as digital culture is it's something that's in your house on your coffee table something you can look you can reference and go back to and I think that's so relevant to a young generation now who are craving that physical connection in a time when so much of life is spent digitally so that that re um that that kind of um re uh, re reaffirmation of print is really interesting for me um what else i think that like i think there's a danger in 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 publishers being over reliant on social media i think social media is is kind of where culture goes to um end up being culture ends up being reduced in those environments it ends up becoming very um a parody of what's going on or a facsimile of what's going on. I think it's okay um, for distributing some ideas to a certain degree, but I think, I think we have to be kind of aware of its limitations. And I think one of the things for me that's really important is that independent culture doesn't really thrive within those corporate structures, right? Because ultimately, they are corporate structures, right? Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, et cetera. So for me, it's about how does independent media and how do independent creators critique those structures? How do you hack from within the system? How do you do things differently? Because they, they're the design, the algorithms and the, 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 the way that the information is designed to be spread, it privileges a monoculture. It privileges sameness. It's about copy, repeat, copy, repeat. And then the things that are most kind of popular are often the things that are most um, obvious or simplistic or reductive. Um, and I really think that the next evolution, if we want to talk about the kind of evolution of digital, I think it's going to be the collapse of those digital empires mm. because they really are empirical thought um they're kind of empirically controlling the minds of young people without young people realizing it and i think what's, what's interesting is when independent creators like yourselves start hacking that system critiquing it and then still start building in and around it and eventually those systems will 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 collapse and there'll be more independent apps more independent types of social media that will evolve that will be as connecting etc but you know i think what you're doing is so important when everybody can be media when everybody is media already like what's the point of being media mm. and what you do so well is that you create communities you create communities and a platform to bring people with you know a shared point of view on the world together but you're but, but in the way that you do it it's very inclusive right and you because it's curated and you're young and you're open-minded about your ethos. But that's not what social media does. You know, there is no ethos. It's a fucking algorithm. It's designed to sell you shit, right? And you can yeah. hack it from within by building a media within a media, but ultimately you're still subject to their rules and regulations. So exactly. to be that's 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 where the new tension will, will come i love that i think that that's something i think about a lot because even down to like the instagram algorithm it tends to favor those larger corporations and then shadow ban smaller creatives and the way that like the feed algorithm works is very interesting and how that shifted um as the platform started getting bigger and what you said about tangibility was something that abby and i talk about all the time like the power of having something physical and having something that's like a physical manifestation of like all these like emotions that are so hard to describe as well um yes yeah I, like I can't the, wait to see your issue i can't wait to have a physical copy of it will you sign it for me oh, and send it over? we will send, sign and send to you 100 oh, yes. i also oh. you mentioned the vinyl thing too i am so biased on that my record collection is about 200 at the moment and it's getting kind of bad but it's like a good a good kind of bad oh that sounds excellent yeah don't stop <laughs> collecting you know i just um 
I'm about to um, I'm about to gift my uh, magazine library and book library to um, Dazed so that it can be accessible to all of the office, all of the students that come through, all of the projects that we do like Dazed Labs and Dazed Academy. The kids can have access to that history in print and physically because it gets lost so quickly. Mm, I love, and I think I do, that just comes back to like the resurgence of print and that idea that every you know ever since I was little I've been told that print's dying like there's no future in print but it's completely the opposite when you're when young people are coming from a place where you want intimacy and you want tangibility and that's just c- completely controlling how media is evolving I think and like you want community you want to look at a media platform and see who's creating it and who's behind it and whose voices you're listening to and it all just it all comes back to that that feeling of intimacy. Exactly. Yeah, we I love it. Reflects ourselves, which I think is really interesting. And also, like, the number of like you know micro niches that can have their own magazine, and the way that different communities can be supported by that like mindedness, and the fact that when somebody sees something published in print, it sometimes it, it kind of gives you a different. It has a certain authority that that digital culture sometimes it's hard to have within a digital space especially within social media where it's very hard to see what the context is you know when you have a magazine you have context and you have the other contextual layers of um, the other articles or authors or types of photography or introduction to the publication etc so you have all this content and you have, a, you have a, a look and a feel that's very contextual and so I think this really brings a certain kind of level like you said of emotion in into you know not but both ways it, to the object and back and back to the viewer and um and that's very uh, important because I think a lot of what we're talking about here, and I think the ethos of days and very much the ethos of pure nowhere is like, how do you provide a sense of confidence for a community or different types of communities within your mother community? How do you provide confidence to support each other through growing up and, you know, becoming, um, more adventurous and more experimental in the ways that you practice your art and your self-expression. How do you do that? How do you give confidence to give voice? How do you create space for others to have voice within your community? And I think a magazine, a printed magazine, an event and physical coming together and, you know, meetups and all of the behind the scenes stuff that you do off the page, the networking and conversations and all of that stuff is so important to driving new possibilities, new forms of cultural production, new opening new horizons in culture. And I think the magazine is like one tenth of 90% effort that goes into like the stuff that happens off the page, which is what is so amazing because it's this, it's this unbelievable network support system for grassroots cultural activism and action and i and i think that's what is important about independent publishers like yourselves that that mainstream publishing doesn't understand any of that they're like how can i rinse you for advertising Mm. (laughs) oh my god is that all (laughs) i need to get moving guys (laughs) oh my gosh okay and that that like leads in perfectly to the next question though because i think that that we need whole time idea... that's what we need we don't need to get rid of <laughs> oh my gosh to... yes um i think that because what, you... <laughs> what you were saying is really interesting because it like that's it's just interesting to unpack right now especially in the middle of a global pandemic and with like the widespread coverage and support of the black lives matter movement how do you view the importance of projecting young creative and diverse voices and how do you think that those ideals are introduced and supported by independent media? Because I know you talked a little bit about um, mass media's reject, like not rejection, but like hesitance to talk on some of the more heavier topics that people are going through. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that that's the power of independent media is that they're not, you know, independent media is not beholden to that that bureaucracy and to that power. I mean, literally mainstream media and corporate culture is 
the problem because it's representative of a power structure that is not listening and is not willing to change and move the parameters, which is what keeps, um, you know, the marginalized and the poor impoverished and continually marginalized. And I think that owning your own voice is critical. It's the sort of mantra of independent publishing, own your own voice, be heard, be published. And I think, you know, what's so important now for me is that youth is our hope, you know, youth is our hope, because youth has everything to gain and, and, and so little to lose from changing everything. And everything, you know, radically needs to change. And that is going to come, that radical projection of a future society that is one of equality is going to be built by youth with some elders who will be from those communities that will help guide and, and, and inspire. But the, 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 the real energy of that change will come from youth for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I, that is, I think that's something we really believe in and just like being able to provide a platform and elevating voices as young as possible and as like in a position where they haven't had an opportunity to get involved or get coverage um, in other situations, especially mainstream situations. We find, yeah, a lot of the power and the real power in articles and stuff is right there. Yeah. Um, so another thing that stuck out to us a lot um, was how you talk about intimacy in your content. Um, and in a recent interview we read with you with Purple Magazine, you talked about how you banned the word content in your offices, pushing the thought that you don't make content, you make stories. And we kind of want to talk about how you work on maintaining that intimacy of story within each piece, as well as the personal connection between the work you publish and yourself. What do you think of the word content? I share a fairly similar view, honestly. Um, we've been struggling to find the right word and I really like story, although sometimes even that, I think it it does. It feels like a unit of measurement. It feels like it feels like you've got quotas, it feels like you've got all these all these ideas around it when you just want to bring real stories and real intimacy and real like feeling into people's lives. And that's all we want to accomplish in the end. So content has never sat right with me either. Yeah, I would I like. About you. Oh, you're so good. I was just like to add on to that. Like, I completely agree. I feel like it doesn't really fulfill like the full purpose. Like using the word content, I feel like strips so much away from the piece and so much, um, so much feeling and like emotion and thought that that goes into it, and it makes it seem a little less special, I guess. Definitely. I mean, I really, I really, you know feel that that word just makes me cringe. It just makes me shudder. And, you know, it's amazing. It's sort of a word that's been invented by, or was invented by Silicon Valley, a word that um, was invented by what seems like engineers and economists to give, like you said, Abby, a kind of unitary measurement, a sort of a fiscal measurement, a kind of volumetric measurement to, um, to what we do. And I think you know, it's really, really adapted by uh, digital media, really taken on board by digital media, um, which mostly, most of the kind of digital media players that became quote unquote successful, right, on a on a on a scale and 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 in within this sort of tech financial bubble, whether they actually really generated any real money or not, we we have no idea. Um, that they seem like sort of Ponzi schemes that just keep on growing um, with kind of fake audiences that keep on kind of being remodeled. Um, and, um, you know, what's interesting about that is that they're just these sort of corporate, um, like content factories or farms. That's sort of, it, it seems like sort of, it seems like sort of, um, you know, the corporate agriculture, that sort of giant kind of monoculture of agriculture that happens in America and in, in other places. And um, yeah, we're the opposite of that. You know, we're about, um, you know, 
crafting a uh, relationship with a real person um, and that person being a, a, an important and valued member of a community. Um, and so, you know, I think even by taking on that label, what you're ultimately doing is, you know, you're sort of, um, you're devaluing the, the, the reader, you know, and then the, the reader or the user is called like, they're called, you know, they're not even called a re reader or user, you know, they're, they're called a consumer and they're consuming your content. And it's just all the language is just really quite perverse. And I think that, um, you know, it's even been extended to like albums and movies is content. It's like, what the fuck? Like, you know, is K.A. <laughs> Twiggs' album content? Is Matty Diop's Atlantic's a piece of content? Is this conversation content? Like, I hope not. I hope yeah. this is more um, meaningful than that because that descriptive um uh, that description is 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 really lazy and like i said you know it, it it's something we should um we should change and i think what's interesting is the precision the new precision around language that's coming through in in in, in culture and how precision in language is very important in terms of being able to um state your intent um and i think we're really being judged now on the intentionality of what we publish um, because, because this is about changing values, you know, radically shifting values. And you're either on the side of progress, you're either on the side of change or you're part of the problem. You know, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the fucking problem. And language is a very, very important tool precision around language specifically to elicit from each other which side we're on, right? Because I think the people that keep talking about content, we kind of know where they're coming from, right? They're not really part of our world. So yeah, let's change. Let um, one final question then before we wrap. Okay, um, this last question was one that... I have to say, I love your website. I love the introduction on your website. And I love your um, manifesto. I really identify with your whole thing around, like, the magazine is like a diary, a mosh pit, a skateboard. Where did that come from? Um, that was actually when Abby and I had first met. We weren't in the same place. And so we would write these really long Google Docs of, like, word vomit and, like, like just really pure writing. And we would send them back and forth to each other. So our about page is really, like, the first thing that we had written collaboratively. So it's, I think, the most intimate piece of writing that we've made together. Yeah. I love it, Abby. Is it the same for you? Because I think it's really about being more than a magazine and being this idea that your culture, your ethos, your spirit, your community can be reflected in all these different, in all these different ways. Yeah, yeah, completely. Like it is just about how it is more than a magazine. It's more than a publication. It's fluid. It's a community. It's it's all these things. So we tried to create that into a piece of writing. Um, yeah, I think we might have to wrap this up right now. Definitely. But thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us and for answering these questions. It was a really amazing conversation and we're, we're really grateful for the time that you put in. Right. I really look forward to staying in touch with you both. Thank you so much for your really thoughtful questions. You're both amazing interviewers. You know, you really are so natural. And um, I can't wait to get the physical copy of Pure Nowhere. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.